So, uh, my name is Adam Lindberg. Um, I work for Per Stritzinger. It's there. Um, and we're doing uh, work on Erlang distribution. So, the title of the talk is uh, 1000 nodes, large messages, uh, we want it all. Uh, and what we've been doing is we have been uh, prioritizing some things with the new o uh, API in OTP 21. And we want to share some results about this and tell us how, how this works actually. So um, we are part of a EU project called Litecone, where we work uh, about edge computing. Um, they do cool stuff like CRDTs, uh, gossip protocols, and things like this. So our, our challenge here is basically uh, scaling Erlang networks, traditional or distributed Erlang networks. Um, this is a uh, video of a uh, prototype system that we've done together with Bosch. So it's a smart conveyor belt. And um, you may not see it, but there is like lots of small boxes with cables in between. Uh, and those are all Erlang nodes running embedded Erlang and controlling this whole conveyor belt. So this is our kind of goal with this project to um, make smart conveyor belts, but actually control them via Erlang. and. This is a prototype with, I think, about 15 nodes. And if you put this in a factory, we want to scale up to hundreds and thousands of nodes because we want like, to build a large factory, not only this small stuff. Um, so Erlang distribution has, uh, it's, it's very useful. Um, and it's very easy to get started with it. But you end up with a cluster, um, a cluster star topology network where every node is connected to every other node. And these networks typically don't scale so well. So as, soon as you start adding nodes and you have more and more nodes, the overhead of communicating uh, with every other node and trying to like sync everything is, is too much. Um, another problem is uh, head of line blocking. So in Erlang distribution, uh, traditionally you have a socket between two nodes that are connected. So if you have a network of five nodes, let's say, each and every node will have a socket open, a TCP socket open to each other node, hence this star topology. Um, and this socket uh, handles all the transportation of all messages, uh, every, all traffic between these nodes when you use distributed Erlang, which means that uh, if you send a, small, a couple of small messages every now and then, and then suddenly you send a large message, like a large binary over this socket, this socket will be busy so it's, uh, everything is sequentialized, and this socket will be busy sending this large binary. And if you have a small me uh, repeated message, this will actually get delayed and put uh, behind a large one, and will, you will see this lag, basically. And this is what head of line blocking means. Um, and there's other issues, like possible concurrency issues. So you could actually parallelize more if you wanted. Uh, we're looking into other things like hard real-time networking and security in hostile networks. So all of this is kind of a challenge if you use normal Erlang distribution because it's based on this simple uh, star topology network with cookies and TCP and so on. So we're playing around with different ideas and prototypes of how to fix this. So in OTP uh, 21, uh, there is uh, a pluggable Erlang distribution API coming. So this is implemented by uh, Rickard Green uh, in the OTP team, and also Ryman Niskanen did the, um, a new uh, feature in OTP 21, which is the SSL distribution. So traditionally, uh, Erlang distribution has always been unencrypted, and you had a kind of secret password called a cookie. Uh, and now we also get uh, SSL features, like if you want to do this over more untrusted networks. So this is one way to use this API, and we'll talk about a prototype of what we did with this API. So normally, you have your two nodes, for example. You have an Erlang VM, you have an application running, and you have OTP on there because you're using Erlang. And in OTP, there is the kernel that you always have to have started. And on the side, um, you have the EPMD that starts, that maps basically. If you start several nodes on one computer, EPMD takes care of mapping ports, open ports, to each respective Erlang node. So you can connect two Erlang nodes on the same computer into a cluster, and they don't get in each other's way, basically. So what this new API allows you to do is it allows you to define a custom plugin module, and you can then take care of the distribution in your application or in your own code, basically. 
And it doesn't even force you to use EPMD. This is also voluntarily. So EPMD still exists, and you can use EPMD API if you want from your custom module. But you can also ignore it or decide to do something completely different. And you are then also in control over the distribution code. So you write all the code that's necessary to transport messages between Erlang nodes. So the requirements to be able to do this is a protocol driver. So this means typically uh, what already exists in Erlang VM, for example, Gen TCP, uh, Gen UDP. But you could also write your own if you want a new protocol or you want some special driver for some reason to do something advanced. Then you need your distribution module, which is this pluggable module that you replace. And you need uh, a way for these modules to be, so the driver modules and your distribution module, to be available at boot time. So because Erlang distribution is set up very early in the process when the VM boots, um, so you either have to uh, put them on the path so they're directly available or enhance your boot scripts for your release so that they are available already at the start. Um, the distribution module uh, implements a callback API that NetKernel will use, so you'll configure uh, netkernel uh, to use this new um, distribution module. The name should end with underscore dist. Uh, I don't think it has, well, technically it has to, yes. Um, and this module uh, listens for incoming connection, uh, creates controllers per connection, and takes care of all the management. So I'll go in a bit more depth of how this works. So this is kind of a diagram I, I try to make to explain how this these callbacks are used. So we yeah, implement five callbacks to uh, make such a distribution, pluggable distribution module. Um, and the first one of these that is called basically when you start your system is uh, the listen callback. So the blue layer in the bottom is representing basically the network or any other systems or nodes that you communicate with. So the listen callback is uh, called when the distribution handler, which is your module, is initialized. And typically, it sets up like the listening part of your distribution protocol. So the example I'm going to use here is, and this I think this comes with OTP also as an uh, example, is a module called GenTCPDist, which just implements Erlang distribution in Erlang using GenTCP. So it's essentially an Erlang implementation of the normal distribution. Um, this callback should return a handle to whatever instance you create in here and some related address structures. Um, then what's called is a uh, accept function. And the responsibility of the accept function is to spawn a acceptor process or somehow start accepting incoming connections. Um, and this uh, process in turn, this acceptor process, it spawns a uh, new um, controllers, um, and then it informs netkernel about them. So that means that when someone tries to connect to your node, in this case we've opened a TCP socket, for example, in gen TCP dist, uh, and you get incoming connections on this listen socket, uh, we need to tell netkernel that there is something new going on here, like a new node is trying to connect. Then we have two uh, callbacks set up and accept connection that are related to the incoming and outgoing connections, basically. So setup is called um, when you connect to another node from the current node. What it does is that it spawns a uh, connection process and a supervision process, which initializes the handshake using this util. So if we look at the picture, um, you have the connection processes. There's a one process per active outgoing or incoming connection that's been set up. But there is also a supervision process that runs on the side. Uh, and the purpose of this one is to initialize the handshake for each connection and then also monitor it uh, in case it goes up and down. Uh, and this is for purposes like uh, taking care of the node events inside Erlang so you know if a connection goes up and down and things like this. Um, the other way uh, that you can get a connection process is by accept connection. Uh, here we don't spawn it ourselves because we're not actively making an outgoing connection, but it's already uh, spawned for us by the acceptor loop process, uh, the one on the left there. Uh, and this callback is then called when that is done and that controller process has started to deal with the handshake from the incoming side. So it's the same as the setup one, but we already have a connection process because it was spawned by the incoming uh, listening socket connection. 
And handshakes are done with the distutil module, so you don't need to do it yourself. Uh, what you need to do is you need to create a callback structure where you point out a few callbacks, like how to send and receive messages and the different parts of your protocol implementation. And then the actual node handshake is already done uh, for you in this util. So you just hand off to this util, which will take care of dealing with the handshake and then monitoring the connection from that point on. Uh, the last one is close, which is called when uh, the Erlang VM shuts down, or if you take down this connection, or stops the net kernel, for example. And here you would do any necessary cleanup, uh, for example, closing the listen socket in case of uh, gen TCP dist. So normally Erlang distribution requires strict ordering. That means that you have one pipe, and everything on that pipe has to go in the exact order that it's sent, and it has to arrive in that order on the remote node. Uh, you can disable this though, and the only thing that actually needs strict ordering right now is the Atom cache. So each distributed connection has an Atom cache for optimization reasons, uh, but if you disable this, you can actually remove the requirement of strict ordering and do cool stuff like you could paralyze, you can have more sockets open, or do other weird things that you might want to do with your custom distribution implementation. So, uh, if you have this module, you met all the prerequisites, uh, you've implemented this, so you have a driver that you're using, you can then enable this with the proto dist flag uh, to, the, to URL. Uh, and you give the module name of the distribution plugin module that you're using without the dist ending because it's added automatically by Erlang. So, uh, this is basically it for the how to use all this. And now Paris is going to give a description of what we've done with this API and some future results that we're looking for. Am I on? Yeah. So, yeah, our first, I need to, oh, there's a click. So, the, Adam just uh, told you about out of order messages. Um, so this was um, the strict ordering requirement is only uh, kind of taking care of the of the actual distribution protocol low level stuff but we still have ordering requirements between processes so we guarantee that like the messages between two processes are ordered and we still need to make care that this requirement is still met because otherwise it will break everything um, uh, so in order to actually do certain things um, which will which I will show you in the future uh, like on the next slides um, we need to support out of order messaging and kind of like reorder them afterwards after the fact and uh, we what, what what we wanted to do is first like test uh, if we can actually achieve something is um, reduce the latency so fix this head of line blocking problem with the large messages that Adam to told you about in the beginning so we, we we built built a prototype with that uh, with, with the with the API that Adam explained just and um, in the messages we get the from PID and the to PID and we need some kind of like sequence order um, between these two processes so we basically define that we have like a channel that's from this PID to this PID on the other node and we enforce the pair the ordering pair channel like we number the messages from for each channel, so we have lots of numbers in the ETS table and, and, and increase the number every time we send a message out. And to, to actually enforce the, the head of line blocking thing is um, we have all these messages in the channel, so basically we have queues for every channel and we round robin through these queues. So then we can chop up large messages into small messages, put it in the queue for this channel and it will get like inter interleaved with the messages uh, for the other channels. So that would, that's supposed to actually fix the head of line blocking problem. Um, so that's next steps we want to do. Um, actually, I will talk about it later, routing protocols like routing messages and, and, and stuff like this. But let me show you the results of this. So what you see here, the blue line, is um, the normal error distribution. Um, we have like the the, we, send, we send a lot of small messages between two nodes and we measure the, 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 the latency of these small messages. And then to actually mess with it, we, we send large messages in between, between other processes between those nodes and see how the latency of the small messages actually decreases. So in the blue line, you actually um, see the head of line blocking problem. So once we said, so it's like um, 
kind of like exponentially increase e increasing size of messages of of the large messages on the horizontal axis, and that's the the way it messes with the with the small messages. So the larger messages we send, the more the latency of our small messages goes up, and it goes up pretty much, and it actually breaks the connection because eventually the ping messages, the live sign messages that actually control the the connection will actually be too late, and then kind of you you die. Um, the red line that you see having almost the same path, that's actually using the, the Gen TCP disk uh, module that actually comes with OTP for like as an example, uh, because we wanted to see like, since we have to implement it as a prototype, we wanted to see like if handling messages on Erlang is actually slowing down stuff uh, a lot and actually if it makes a big difference. So because the only fair comparison would be between the red line and, and, and now the yellow line. So the yellow line is basically our prototype for fixing the head of line blocking. And as you see, that I mean, the latency has to go up because um, you use bandwidth on the link, of course. And that's unavoidable. But it, it goes up in a more linear way um, with like an exponential increase of the large message size. And that's actually a pretty nice result. So we're pretty happy on that. Um, this is a cross-section basically on the end of like if you look at this, if you make a cross-section, like a vertical cross-section of the actual distribution of latency on, on, on the left end of the, of the graph. So because here you see the median, I think. Yeah, median run trip time. So this is the cross-section, so we can actually see how, how stable is the latency. Um, and you see like the red and blue one are like kind of overlapping, so it's like, it's pretty wide. And uh, you see like the yellow one is also like not like very narrow, but it's, it's right on the on the on the shorter end of the of the other messages so this is kind of also being a nice result and um so this is about um i, I need to look at the, the 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 scales here so this is also like the that that's actually the background messages uh, we send and the time in milliseconds actually i don't know what this means let's just skip over this um, I forgot. <laughs> um, so this was like our first experiment actually to fix one of the problems we have. Uh, now, now let's talk about the, 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 the scaling of to, to, to 1,000 nodes. So we want large messages and 1,000 nodes, we told. So that's more like a future work, so I don't have like current work, but like that's more like the plan we have. Um, so to actually make this more understandable, let me explain you routing protocols especially link state routing protocols, which is like a, a certain class of routing protocols. So a link state routing protocol, um, <coughs> if you have a network, like the blue nodes is the network, and um, every node uh, only near, uh, in the beginning only like talks to its neighboring nodes, so <coughs> it says hello to every neighbor, and, and actually it makes a little like subgraph of its local neighborship, so it knows actually like so node A knows like node B and node C is a neighbor of mine. And that's the little graphs that are, the little subgraphs that are on the side. Um, and what we then do, so that's actually called a link state packet, um, which link state protocol comes from, um, because it's the link states of the local node. And, and then what we, what we need to do is, or what the routing protocol needs to do is to distribute these messages um, to all other nodes. And it, this is done by a thing called reliable flooding. So reliable flooding is, in principle, very easy. You send stuff to your neighbors, you gossip protocol, you, your link state protocols to neighbors, and when they see something new, um, they send it on to their neighbors, and then you flood your information to all the nodes. Um, to actually explain it in detail how it's actually done is actually a whole talk in itself, because there's lots of nifty little details, like when node comes up and go down, you need to actually make sure that you don't send around old stuff and it takes over the new stuff. There's, there's a ton of like decades of like experience in this uh, routing protocols because the the one that I'm like introducing is from the 80s, so there's it is running for a while. And so um, I just skip over this, and so matching happens, and we basically every node has all these uh, these link step packets collected, and therefore it has the information to actually have a little image of the whole graph on every node. So every node knows the whole topology. And that's a nice thing because then you basically run Dijkstra's algorithm, um, basically building a local tree, like starting from myself to all other nodes, um, which then actually gives you the shortest path to every other node. 
So everyone has like a little roadmap to which gives you shortest path routing. And and so what you do is also like if anything, if any link breaks, you send out new link state packets and it actually pretty quickly converges. So that's one of the main advantages that it very quickly converges to the new state. So then you can route around the problem and do things. So the, the routing protocol um, uh, we are actually looking at is called ISIS. Um, that stands for inter-system to inter-system. Um, and an inter-system is actually a router. But ISO called it inter-system back then. So that ISO has like a lot of different names for things that ITF has other names. So we would call it a router, and an inter-system is basically a router. So there's a protocol where routers speak to other routers. And it's a, there's an ISO standard on it. Um, it also has, there's also other link state protocols. Um, uh, one of the most known is OSPF, Open Shortest Pass First. That's basically um, IETF's um, re-implementation of the idea because um, ISIS is not invented here and we do our things ourselves and we want to have our RFC and do our own thing. That was 10 years later and people who like ISIS said they are still 10 years behind. <laughs> so. The reason why we like ISI is for what we want to do is it's protocol agnostic. It actually doesn't care if it's IP, pro uh, if it's IP packets, Ethernet packets, whatever. Totally agnostic of the protocol. That, so it would work on any protocol. Um, it, it's the de facto standard what, which basically all large service providers have on the backbone. Like every large company has ISI running on the backbone usually. And and it also, for example, there you can see the protocol agnostic uh, things. There's an IEEE standard, the 802 IEEE standard is basically Ethernet and uh, Wi-Fi and all these uh, standards. And 802.1 AQ is actually shortest pass bridging and is uh, meant to be a replacement for the spanning tree protocol that uh, if you buy a normal cheap switch on in a shop that includes spanning tree protocol. But spanning, spanning tree protocol is not very uh, not very efficient because it actually does a random spanning tree and not an optimal spanning tree. And the shortest path route uh, spanning tree thing, and it actually uses ISIS protocol to actually find these topology things. This, this is on the Ethernet level. So this is on layer two, but you can also run it on layer three because it's protocol agnostic. And of course, you can't run it on anything, like Erlang distribution, for example. Um, the very nice thing uh, uh, which makes it very interesting for us in the especially is it's extensible. So you can actually slap your own stuff on. And it's extensible because the ISO likes their protocols uh, made out of things called type length value tuples. So you have a type flag, a number, and a length and an arbitrary binary value. And uh, there's like number spaces for like user defined types and you can actually slap your own type length value stuff on on the actual link state protocols. So what you then get is a labeled graph where you actually can label your own stuff on the graph nodes. And, and the routing protocol actually makes sure that every other node also has a labeled graph. And so you can actually attach stuff on it. Another nice feature, which is not so important for us, but for a very large scaling, it's a two-layer hierarchy. So yeah, let's attach our own stuff. Um, so there's basically layer one, layer two, um, and there's nodes that are both layers. So you can basically layer one nodes talk to only via layer one nodes, layer two nodes only talk to layer two nodes. So the, the thing in below would be the backbone, in this case, the layer two, which connects layer one things. Um, but you can easily scale to a, a few hundred nodes with, with just one layer. So usually people start with like layer two only, and like you can scale to 400 to 1,000 nodes with just one layer. So the two-layer thing is for really huge networks. Um, so what can we actually do with this? We can actually slap on these type length value things um, for node discovery, like attach node names to the, to the bubbles in the graph. So we actually know which node lives where. Um, which basically makes it de facto an EPMD replacement because, we, of course, we can also attach the, no the port number with the node name. That's a trivial extension. So we actually know now the port number and the node name of every Erlang node in the whole network. And um, we could even, if we don't overdo it, use it uh, or abuse it as a global process registry because why not attach like name PID uh, tuples uh, to the thing. 
So not overdoing it, because if you overdo it and register a lot of names and I have a lot of change in these names, you probably flood the network too much with these link state protocols and you will die in a fire. But yeah, that's not, for, not overdoing it. But it's not a real replacement for global process registry because um, you cannot have these unique things like a unique name in the network. But I think, well, my opinion is that the, the whole thing with having a unique name like where there's only one in a, in a very large network is actually a thing that can't work. Because you have net splits and two names and, and, and then these net splits happen too often and then like you, you, all not you only do leadership election all the time, kind of. So I, I think more like that like a name can be like more a group thing, like a PG2 thing replacement, that a name can be uh, registered uh, several times. But the nice thing is that we, we attach it to the routing graph so we can actually do uh, things like send this message to the next function with name this. So, and then it would take the shortest path to this function. For example, you can have like a node that collects all the log, all the logs and then you just register like logger or whatever, and it, then you send it, send it to, send to the next logger. And then if your graph gets too large and the traffic gets too much, then you just introduce more logger processes and it, everybody sends to their shortest, shortest logger. So that's quite nice. And we can also, since we have the graph, we can actually route our airline messages from node to node. And if you route airline messages from node to node, um, then what actually can happen that they can get out of order because like one message takes one route the other message takes another route and like gets holed up somewhere and then th they come out in the wrong order and that's why we initially wanted these sequence numbering ac actually so the sequence numbers ac on the messages give us the fragmentation uh, use, use case for blocking for head of line blocking and we can actually reorder our messages and we can actually learn if we lost a message because like you have a gap and you get the next sequence number, and at some point you give up on the, on the gap message and say, oh, I lost the message. And so this is the invariant. So the between processes, we need this ordering. And there's another uh, thing that basically all the messages from one node are supposed to come between a node up and a node down. So actually, you could be backward compatible by if you lose some messages, one or even a bunch of, by inserting a node down, node up event for this node. So actually it would be kind of backward compatible if it doesn't happen too often with pre-existing software that actually relies on this um, invariance. But probably you also want to have like optional thing that you kind of like get a special message which, which says you, yeah, you just lost three messages. Deal with it. That might be an extension. So what, what, what the next steps basically with this is like the next year, hopefully, hopefully can show you next year what we actually achieved there, is for one thing, at the moment, we have, the, we have basically like between the, the actual processes things and the driver, that's where we actually insert our own airline module and do this stuff. Um, what we actually want to do is, uh, we want to <coughs> insert it like into the actual process context when it actually, the the, the messages are serialized because they're serialized in the actual process. So it's actually, it scales better on, 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 the, on a multi-core node, for example. Um, and there we actually want to insert the sequence numbers in the fragmentation already. And then defragment it on the other end. So that would be uh, the way if we basically use our prototype with the sequence numbers and, and basically push it down into the OTP, and in the, into the Erlang runtime system C code implementation. So that would be, one next step so we can actually also be more efficient. So, I mean, like let's skip over the routing thing. So we have message, we have message sequence numbers and fragmentation so we can actually make sure that our messages are small enough and that they actually can get out of order. So why don't we just put it in UDP packets and send it on, just send it out, fire and forget. Um, which would be pretty efficient because you don't have connections, so you don't run into the problem that you have a fully connected network of airline nodes, you just send the messages where they need to go. And if you have a pretty normal, reliable Ethernet uh, with, with like large switches, you probably won't drop too many UDP packets if you don't overdo. I mean, usually you only, overdo, you only lose UDP packets if you overdo it, if you stream a lot or whatever. Uh, but with that, you have to deal with that on the application level. So that would be one very easy way to actually scale up, just use UDP. 
But we have a special application. Um, the video you saw in the beginning, so this is a Miranda for the video, we have these conveyor belt systems. And the conveyor belt systems, they, they don't have a very efficient backbone or whatever. So they have a topology that looks like this. So we have a mesh network of nodes that are connected to neighboring nodes. So it's, they're daisy-chained and like uh, cross-connected. But um, so if you think conveyor belt, it's a, like a, a longish thing. Um, so it has a, a large diameter, this mesh network. So diameter of a graph is like how many hops it is from like one end to the other end, the longest stretch. And so this is, this is a way where we actually then need a way to actually route between the nodes. And of course, we could route these UDP packets between these nodes, like using the routing level of the, uh, of the operating system um, or of our like, really non-operating system of the small embedded nodes. Um, but I think it might be like, more reliable because the UDP packet just gets dropped when the buffer is full. Uh, I, but it might be more reliable to actually use the TCP connections, like TCP connections between on all these al along all these lines, and actually use the routing protocol or the information from the routing protocol, which we actually happen to have a initial implementation in Erlang already, um, conveniently um, to get out this topology and and only connect to neighboring nodes, and and forward the messages to all other nodes, from node to node basically, not from operating system to operating system. Um, yeah, that is basically the end of it at the moment. So that's because that's our application. Um, I also wanted to like the technology we use in these embedded nodes um, on, on the, along the conveyor belt is actually available also for everybody as an evaluation board. Uh, it's called the GRIS board. You probably saw the blue uh, banner up there. There's a 20% discount. Um, so that's actually a, a getting started board, uh, but GRISP is actually a software stack, so which is all open source, so you can just get it. So.